Uh, Olivia, you are um, you are the founder, correct, of of, of Histra. That's correct. And, and tell uh, for those of those folks who might not be familiar with Histra, what is what does the company do? When was it founded, uh, and what was it uh, set up to do? Uh, very good, with pleasure. Um, so I founded uh, Histra in two thousand and nine. Out of my uh, experience as a strategy consultant, I spent eighteen years with McKinsey as well as one of the senior partners there. And uh, at age forty-five, I decided I would switch my career. And I spent six years working with Ashoka, mostly in Western Europe. And these six years have led me to discover the world of social entrepreneurship and how incredibly innovative social entrepreneurs are and how effective the solutions uh, they, could, uh, they have designed to solve social problems in a sustainable manner. But as I was uh, that impressed, at the same time, I realized that they were very unlikely to be able to bring to scale the innovations they had come up with. Um, and I, because probably of my corporate uh, background, I thought that for a number of these innovations, uh, corporations could play a key role in, in uh, designing business strategies inspired by these innovations developed by social entrepreneurs business strategies that could solve social problems in a sustainable and highly scalable manner. So, therefore, the, the focus was on working with these corporates to try to convince them to change their strategies and policies. And I felt that by being a consultant to these corporations, I would be in a better position to influence their behavior than if I stayed in the NGO world. Mm -hmm. Hence, the creation of Histra as a consulting firm, even though, uh, even though we are for profit, we consider ourselves a for profit tool with a social purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you, you need to, you said walk the talk, I think. You need uh, to, if I was going to recommend to clients that they could pursue business strategies that made business sense, but enable to solve social problems, it was a good idea to try to apply this recipe to me first. Absolutely. And also to leave all the ambiguities that this implies. And actually I had some social entrepreneurs who were uncomfortable with me trying to create a consulting firm, working with corporates, uh, taking their ideas. There was a bit of discomfort. But um, I think that the only way for us to be effective in this type of strategies is to be comfortable with these ambiguities uh, and be able to surpass them by being focused on the ultimate objective, which is to help the people in greatest need. Right. And, and since 2009, you've put out uh, three studies with, with, uh, with, the with your clients um, uh, on some pretty principal areas around based the pyramid knowledge and, and practice. Mm -hmm. One on based the pyramid energy uh, uh, resources and understanding around solar models and cook stoves, mm -hmm. which was very influential, pulled together a lot of different research. Another one on, uh, on expanding uh, ICT, and mm -hmm. then I think, I believe a third on, on, on water resources. On safe water. Yeah. yeah. I wanted to ask, I mean, it's, I know it's a big, broad question, but how have, when you look at those three studies um, and, and the number of enterprises that you've spoken with, um, what are some commonalities and themes that you found uh, uh, in researching those among those models that are successful, those businesses that, that are able to be self-sustaining and also make an impact? Um, that's a big question. It is. Uh, I think what, what we found out in, in all these sectors and also on housing, which is also something we, we worked on, right. is... Um, is the fact that in general, I would say, engineers have done their job. Mm -hmm. By this, I mean that in general, you have products or devices that are good enough, that are cheap enough, uh, that are perfectly affordable, and that uh, could be deployed and could reach uh, the base of the pyramid, if they had the adequate distribution, marketing, and selling systems, and or after-sales service in place. So if you want, the, the upstream part of the value chain is fundamentally okay. The problem is the downstream. Mm -hmm. 
For instance, I remember discussions with the cement company who were saying, yeah, our cement is very expensive. Maybe we could design a new type of cement that would be cheaper because you don't need the time pipe of perf technical performance to build a, a small home uh, as opposed to a big building. So maybe we are over-engineering. I said, no, thank you, but your cement is okay, sir. <laughs> we, we don't want you to change it. Uh, yes, it's a bit expensive, but honestly, if it's cheaper, people won't buy more. The problem is they don't know how to build. They are using too much cement. Uh, that's how they, you, if you want to help them save money, teach them how much cement they need to put into making the concrete. Helping them design rooms or homes that won't fall apart. Mm -hmm. uh, help them in the financing system that they would need in order to make these investments. Uh, uh, arrange for them to find the construction companies that can help them do that. That's what's missing. It's all the downstream part. Your cement is okay. So the guys in the R&D department, uh, they can't drop their pens. Uh, the marketers, in the broad sense of the term, all the activities that happen after the product has left the plant, the marketer is the one who has not done its job. And that's, that's, that's a really good, a good segue into your most recent project, which is, uh, which is marketing for the BOP. And a new uh, study that you have out, a new uh, white paper, um, is uh, lessons learned from 15 global pioneers that challenge, co challenge conventional sales and marketing approaches to successfully serve the poorest. And so you talk to uh, history to talk to uh, a number of different firms, right? A lot of different uh, non-specific sectors, m a variety of sectors. Mm -hmm. And what were you what were you after with this particular research in terms of the the successes? But look, so we we identified across sectors and across geographies uh, people who were doing a really good job in in marketing, in selling, in distributing, in servicing uh, these populations, and. Uh, we had found out that they were doing really things that were uncommon, that uh, I would say defy normal marketing practice. In my 18 years at McKinsey, I had never done, seen people do things like that. Um, and so we felt that if we were going to analyze them in detail and benchmark their operations so that we could actually measure the, their performance along 50 uh, key performance indicators, things such as the, the sales per salesperson, the churn of the sales force, the gross margin, the net margin, um, the, the number of salesperson per manager, all these very operational or financial uh, performance indicators, we, we could start uh, learning what does it take to serve these markets effectively. And also by visiting these, each of these 15 uh, companies, or I say companies, many of them are NGOs uh, or social entrepreneurs, uh, by analyzing their best practices to really understand what is it that they do differently. Right. And what was very interesting, a bit like in a mosaic, if you know, when you look one by one, you don't understand. Uh, but when you step back and you look at the 15, you say, ha ha. There are some common features, be it uh, selling latrines in Cambodia or cook stoves in Ghana or home improvement projects in Mexico. These three guys who probably have never heard of each other are doing things quite similarly. And there are some lessons that can be learned from these practices. Right. And, and, and one of the things that jumped out at me is just the, 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 um, the price sensitivity point. Um, and this uh, comes back to maybe more business model perhaps than, than direct marketing, but is, is that those folks who are at the base of the pyramid who are low income, they want to buy something that they know will work and they're willing to pay a little bit higher premium on it if they have some of the additional instruction on how to use it and some sort of, some sort of um, involvement with the, with the seller on, on, on how to use the product properly and some, not, maybe not a guarantee, but a a stronger assurance that the product will work and will will save them time, money, and energy. It, it, you are perfectly right. But in what you said, you said a little bit higher margin. So you, there is an ideological discomfort 
with the notion that the poor are going to pay higher prices for what they need. So we would like to be able to say that they, it's, they, they will buy at reduced margins somehow. But there is here a paradox. When you look at water purifiers, uh, improved cook stoves, solar lanterns, solar home systems, uh, water pumps, etc., when you look at the economics of these devices, you find out that they are incredibly attractive, lucrative investment opportunity for the poor. By changing a, a, a kerosene lamp, which costs two or three dollars of kerosene a month, replacing it with a solar lantern that costs fifteen dollars, you make the payback is in a few months. So the returns on investments are more than one hundred percent. In the in our sample, it went from one hundred percent to five thousand percent returns. So you could, I know it's a it's a provocation, but you could describe the poor as being surrounded by incredibly attractive investment opportunities, but that they cannot exercise because, as you said, they are worried that if the solar lantern breaks down, who is going to repair it? Right. Or if the water pump doesn't work, what's going on? So what they are worried with is not, they are not interested in a cheaper price. Because if I tell you, okay, the solar lantern, you are worried that it will break down, I give you a 10% discount. You'll say, sir, you are not listening. <laughs> oh, the, temp the price is okay, but will it work? Yeah. That's my problem. Right. So the problem of the poor is not high price, it's high risk. Mm -hmm. So if you are able to provide them with a solution that is risk-free, that is going to guarantee the thing will work, then they are willing to make the investment mm -hmm. and pay a higher price for that because that's what the, the, the challenge is. For instance, Gramin Shakti in Bangladesh is providing a service where they sell solar home systems, but they provide financing. But the person who collects the monthly payment is the maintenance technician that comes to check the solar home system every month. So the, the customer knows that if the maintenance guy doesn't come, he won't pay. So he knows the maintenance guy will come and that therefore the machine would work. Right. Interestingly, Ramin Shakti also knows that the guy will pay because if he doesn't pay, the maintenance guy won't come. Right. <laughs> Hold each other, if you want, and that reduces the risk of the transaction and allows very poor people to buy a system that costs $300 a piece, which is a substantial investment. So, if you're, this is really about reducing the risk of the investment, which is in itself a very attractive uh, investment. That's interesting. And, and the other thing that, that uh, just on marketing specifically that I wanted to ask you about was the, was the below line marketing and, and, and what we would, uh, you know, it, much more targeted marketing as opposed to blanket billboards and advertisements that, you know, might work in urban areas, certainly wouldn't work in rural areas. What were some of the things that stood out for you on, on that point? Of I think this is, this is a very good point. One thing we, we realized that many people are focused, or many marketers are focused on raising product awareness. Uh, so they do marketing campaigns, radio, sometimes even TV, billboards, etc. But we have seen many cases where actually awareness about the products is very high, 60, 80 percent. But actual people buying is 10 to 15 percent. So because the problem is not that they, they don't understand what the product is and what are the benefits. Mm -hmm. They perfectly understand it. They are smart people. They know. But the question is they doubt whether this is really going to work. Or they, are, may, they may not have the cash in hand. So they would need a financing uh, solution. Or they are worried that after-sales service won't work. It's nice to buy a water purifier, but if in six months' time you need to buy a new filter, are you sure there will be a guy selling the filter to you? Right. Don't know for sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, when you or I buy a TV, we don't read the fine print. We know that if something goes wrong, we can go back to the store and they'll fix it for us. But if you are in the middle of nowhere and you buy something which is new, 
uh, you are very worried about what this after-sales service is going to be. And therefore, the only way, the only marketing uh, approach that we have seen work and that all successful marketers use are village-level tactics. They come into a village, they find some early adopters um, who will be, they make sure these guys are very satisfied with the products and then they let word of mouth uh, do its work. Mm -hmm. This is what will, in the end, convince people that their neighbor, they bought one of these solar lanterns, when they had a problem, they fixed the problem, and now they can do, and they will go and buy. Now, the thing is that this is a slow process. You cannot accelerate it, right? You, it takes the time it takes for people to be reassured and be willing to buy. So for the people who are in a hurry, who want quick sales, their lever they're going to use is marketing campaigns. And that's where often people funded by foundations who have committed to short-term measurable number of devices sold and whose future grant is dependent on reaching these milestones, these guys who are in a hurry, they will, have, they will be pushed towards trying to do these marketing campaigns to accelerate sales. Mm -hmm. The guys we have seen most successful are the ones who are patient, are therefore sales will pick up when they pick up. We cannot accelerate the process except by making sure all our customers are delighted. Right. right. So it's very much a, a tortoise versus a, a hare strategy in that, in that sense. A, a, steady, a steady approach. A careful, uh, and, but, and when you think about the fact that most of these organizations are socially minded, it's sometimes surprising, to use this word, uh, to see that few, many of them are not actually focused on measuring customer satisfaction and following on why is wrong, what is wrong and how to fix it. Mm -hmm. right? So I think focusing on customer satisfaction as the driver of loyalty and positive word of mouth should be the natural strategy for any socially minded marketer. Right. Well, I mean, we've only gotten into a couple points here, but I but there's a lot in this paper that I think is valuable for um, for any level startup or, or multinational. Um, and I know you're going to be sharing quite a few of these findings. Tell me about the 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 marketing for the for the base of the pyramid conference you have coming up in, in London, right, in, in March. It's in London. Uh, so on the 5th and 6th of March, we are bringing together these 15 organizations um, because we believe that it will be a unique opportunity for them to meet, to share best practices, uh, to challenge or agree with uh, our findings, and most importantly, to discuss together as the leaders in the field what can they do, what initiatives are needed to progress the field as a whole. Mm -hmm. so this will be the two first days, a small workshop of practitioners. On the, sixth, on the 7th of March, a Thursday, um, the conference will be open uh, to people interested in, uh, in these topics. It will be an opportunity to discuss the findings of the research, but also to meet and discuss with these 15 organizations. I would want to say that this will take place in the Shell Centre uh, in, um, in London and that uh, this or project and this conference is sponsored by three leading foundations, the, the Gates, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, the Children Investment Fund Foundation and the Shell Foundation. That's great. We'll include all the, all the links and, and uh, um uh, appropriate times and dates for people if they're interested and hopefully they are interested in attending and can't can have the opportunity to um, well well thanks so much Olivier for your for your time today and um, and good luck with the conference good luck with the paper and we appreciate the time thank you so much Scott